when you set out to tell a story that recalls certain events, where do you start? At the beginning, I hear you say, and that's correct, but the beginning, in your opinion, may differ from someone else's. Therefore, how you begin may be different from them. And when we consider the case of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, that is why you see a variation in how the writers of those accounts begin. You might automatically assume they would begin with the birth of Christ, but they don't because his birth, life, death, and resurrection has to be understood in the context of the history of God's chosen people, <clears throat> the Jews. So in their own way, the writers of these gospel accounts sought to make the point that Christ's birth and all that followed was part of God's sovereign plan for his people, not a divergence from it. It was the point in human history when a promise God had made at the beginning of that history became a reality. Therefore, as we turn to Luke's gospel account, we find that instead of starting at the point when the angel Gabriel visited Mary and told her that she had been chosen by God to be the mother of the Messiah, he did so at least six months prior to that event. <clears throat> and he began by recounting how John the Baptist was born. He did so because John was also spoken of in the Old Testament as the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And this is interesting when you realize that Luke, as we believe, or was we believe, a Gentile by birth. That is to say, <clears throat> he wasn't brought up in the Jewish faith. But yet, as a convert to Christ, he understood the importance of the Old Testament in regards to explaining the story of Christ. So you see, those who today dismiss the Old Testament as irrelevant are forgetting the, the fact that being familiar with what it teaches us is crucial for being able to appreciate the person and ministry of Jesus Christ and for understanding much of what the New Testament teaches us. <clears throat> Luke begins his gospel account by giving us a broad marker as to when it occurred in human history, given that King Herod ruled from 37 to 4 BC. And then having told us this information, he, he gives us some background information on two people, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. <clears throat> Both of them had good pedigree, as we might say, in terms of their Jewishness, given that they were both descendants of Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, and who was the first man des designated by God to hold the office of priest. As such, then, he was the one chosen by God to represent the Israelites before God to make sacrifices on their behalf in order to atone for their sins. So, as far as Jewish religious pedigree was concerned, Zechariah and Elizabeth ticked all the boxes. They were top-notch. But not only that, as verse 6 tells us, when it came to their spirituality, they were an exemplary couple. They were faithful and sincere in keeping God's laws. But that doesn't mean that they were sinless. It simply means that they, were, that they earnestly sought to obey God's laws that this devotion was a constant feature of their lives day to day. In fact, it is what defined them. So thus far in the story of Zach, in this story, Zachariah and Elizabeth looked like the model couple. But then verse 7 shatters the illusion that everything was sorted in their lives. They only are told that they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. That is to say she was infertile and they were both well on in years. And this highlights, highlights a great need, which is the first thing I want us to consider from this passage. A great need. <clears throat> Childlessness is a terrible affliction for a married couple today. But back then was even more so because of the stigma that it carried. You see, back then, <clears throat> a, a, a woman's primary rule in society was seen as having and raising children to continue the family line. So being infertile meant that Elizabeth would have been regarded as someone who was not making a positive contribution to society. She was not fulfilling her God-given role as a woman. 
This meant that she would have been viewed as a lesser person, someone without much value, someone to be looked down upon. But not only that, her infertility would have also been viewed by others as a reproach from God himself. Such a belief came from the religious teaching of the Jewish faith, which taught that obedience to God would result in being blessed by him, whilst being disobedient would lead to being subject to his curses. This teaching is contained in passages such as Deuteronomy 28, wherein we are told that one of the covenant curses for disobedience that people could expect to incur was the inability to have children. So you see, despite Zechariah and Elizabeth leading an exemplary religious life, <clears throat> her childlessness implied that one or other, or both of them, were guilty of a great sin and that they were being punished by God. They may have looked like the model, faithful, obedient couple, but their circumstances suggested that they were anything but. Therefore, while whilst innocent of such sin before God, in the eyes of their community, they were guilty. These two things meant that Elizabeth particularly felt disgraced in her community, something which is alluded to in verse 25. Can you imagine <clears throat> carrying the burden of such shame day in, day out, of being talked about, and possibly being shunned by some people even though you are innocent? Can you imagine the helplessness of knowing that there is absolutely nothing you can do about it? Given that with each passing year, the chances of having children recede until it is beyond hope, humanly speaking. Zechariah and Elizabeth had a great need to be redeemed in the eyes of their community, but they couldn't do anything about it because they were both well on in years. Humanly speaking, their situation was hopeless. Their great need could not be met. They were hostages to their circumstances without hope of rescue. Zacharias and Elizabeth's circumstances remind me that in a similar way, all of us have a great need, and also, like them, we are hostages to our circumstances. Humanly speaking, we cannot, cannot affect a change of our circumstances, so we have no hope of rescue. But our need is not to be redeemed in the eyes of our community or any other person for that matter. It is rather the need to be redeemed in the eyes of God. The scriptures teach us that we are all guilty of sin, whether we like to admit that fact or not, and that that sin puts us at odds with God. <clears throat> we are an offense to him, scripture teaches us, because, as scripture says, he cannot even look upon sin. Occasionally we may come across a picture or we may catch a whiff of something that is so repulsive to us that it turns our stomach instantly. So we have to turn away or move away immediately if we are not to be physically sick. And in a similar sense, because of his holiness, our sin makes us repulsive to God. He cannot have us in his presence. Now in the here and now, of our physical lives, that may not seem so much of a problem, but it is and it will be ever more so when we step from the shores of this world into eternity. Because once there, as I was speaking to the children, we will stand before God. And if we still reek of sin, we'll be cast out of his presence to eternal suffering. Oh, we may think that we're not that bad, but scripture tells us that we are. And it also tells us that there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do about it. So Elizabeth and Zechariah had a great need and their situation was humanly speaking beyond hope. But then everything changed. As verses 8 to 22 tell us, when Zechariah received a divine promise, which is the second thing I want us to consider from this passage. Now when we learn that Zechariah was on duty at the temple, something which he did for seven days, at least twice a year, 
We're also told that on this occasion he was chosen to go into the inner sanctuary of the temple called the holy place to burn incense. Now the holy place was the chamber between the area where the people would gather for worship and prayer and the most holy place or holy of holies which was the space that represented God's dwelling place upon the earth amongst his people. The layout of the temple was a a physical reminder of how people could not simply approach God on their own terms. They needed a representative, in this case the priests, to make sacrifice for them. In that inner sanctuary, or holy place, where Zechariah went, there were three significant items, one of which was the altar of incense, upon which special incense was burned in the morning and evening to symbolize the prayers of God's people proceeding up to him. This altar was located just before the curtain which separated the holy place from the most holy place. And this meant that burning incense on it brought those doing it symbolically close to the presence of God. Therefore, given the significance of his location and purpose, burning incense on the altar was considered a special duty and those chosen to do it were highly honored. And it was whilst performing this duty on one day, most probably during the evening sacrifice, that an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah. That angel standing on the right-hand side of the altar signified his importance, as that was the place of honor in the culture of the day. And that angel who identified himself as Gabriel told Zechariah news that was literally music to his ears. He told him, Elizabeth was going to bear a son that they were to call him John. He explained how John would be great in the sight of the Lord and that he was never to take wine or other fermented drink. And that is significant because when priests were on duty at the temple they were to abstain from alcoholic beverages to signify separation from ordinary everyday life for a divine task. So John's lifelong abstinence signified that he had a divinely ordained task for his entire lifetime. As verse 17 tells us, he had been appointed by God to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. (coughs) I imagine that Zechariah struggled to take all of this news in. Not only was he going to have a son, but this child had been ordained by God to turn God's people back to the Lord. Like the prophets of old, he was going to be a herald. He was going to be like a conduit between God and his people who spoke God's word to them. There had not been the like of such for over 400 years. But now Gabriel gave this divine promise to Zechariah as he performed his priestly duty in the temple. It was a promise that took away Zechariah and Elizabeth's hopelessness. It was a promise that would rescue them from their circumstances. It was a promise that would redeem them in the eyes of their community. It would liberate them from the shame they carried. It was a promise that would give them a completely new future. You know, as I think about that promise and what it meant for both Zechariah and Elizabeth, I am reminded of another even greater divine promise from God. It is a promise to take away our hopelessness, to rescue us from our circumstances caused by our sinfulness. It is a promise to liberate us from the consequences of our sin, to redeem us before God and to give us a completely new future. It is the promise of forgiveness for all who will believe, accept and receive Christ as their Savior. John John was born into the world to turn, turn God's people back to him, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. But Jesus Christ was born into the world to save his people from their sins. John was only able to rescue Zechariah and Elizabeth from their hopelessness but Christ is able to rescue all who trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins 
from their hopelessness. John was only able to redeem Zechariah and Elizabeth in the eyes of their community. But Christ is able to redeem, to redeem all who trust in him in the eyes of God. He is, able to weigh, he is able to take away our disgrace before God. He can transform us from those who reek of sin to those who have no trace of it whatsoever. Here in this passage we see that Zechariah and Elizabeth had a great need and that God in his mercy gave him a divine promise. And then finally, we find a human response to that promise. And herein, as we consider that human response, we find two different responses. The first of which is doubt. As we know, Zechariah was terrified at the appearance of the angel Gabriel, and, and who wouldn't be? It was, after all, the standard response recorded for us throughout Scripture whenever a person encountered a heavenly herald. But then Gabriel reassured Zechariah and gave him the wonderful news that would change everything. Everything him and Elizabeth. However, Zechariah didn't believe him. As verse 18 tells us, he said, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well on in years. At first glance, that seems like an innocent enough and therefore logical question and statement, given that he and Elizabeth were past childbearing years. But that is to forget who gave this promise to Zechariah. It was none other than the angel Gabriel who stood in the presence of Almighty God and had been sent from the throne room of heaven to deliver this good news to Zechariah. So in essence here, Zechariah was doubting the actual word of God, which is the same as doubting God himself. Yes, Zechariah's and Elizabeth's circumstances were humanly speaking beyond hope. But Almighty God the creator of the heavens and the earth had just promised to remedy the situation for him. However, God's word was not enough for Zechariah. He wanted some sort of proof that what Gabriel had told him would become a reality. Zechariah doubted God's ability to fulfill this promise. But Elizabeth's reaction was entirely different. Her response was humble acknowledgement. As verse 25 states, when she became pregnant, Elizabeth declared, The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people. Now at first glance, you could think that her reaction was nothing more than you would expect, given that she actually was pregnant. But that would be to miss the point that her declaration shows how she knew that her pregnancy was entirely the work of God. She was in no doubt that God, in his mercy, had enabled her to become pregnant. Yes, she and Zachariah had a their parts to play, but she knew that only God had enabled what to that point had been impossible. She was in no doubt that he had changed the biologi biological circumstances which had prevented her from conceiving. Therefore, Elizabeth humbly acknowledged that she was the recipient of God's blessing. So having considered the great need that all of us have, and God's divine promise, I wonder how have you responded? Maybe you're like Zachariah and you doubt the integrity of God's word and the promise of salvation it proclaims. Maybe you doubt Christ's willingness or ability to take away your sin, to make you acceptable to God. <clears throat> Maybe you want additional reassurance that God's promise of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone is a reality. If that is the case, can I encourage you to recognize that this is the very word of God, the one who is the essence of truth, and who, as the creator and sustainer of all things, cannot fail. Because if you don't, then in a similar sense, or in a similar way to Zechariah, you will be struck dumb in the sense that when you stand before God, you'll not be able to offer any defense for doubting and therefore rejecting God's divine promise of salvation. Or maybe you have committed your life to Christ, but you've started to doubt the reality of your salvation and you want proof, as it were, that you have been ransomed, healed, 
restored and forgiven. If that's the case, can I encourage you to consider Elizabeth's response? Can I encourage you to humbly take God at his word and recognize that if you have cast yourself upon God's mercy, seeking forgiveness in Christ's name, then your transformation before God is his work, solely his work. Can I encourage you to remember that your acceptability before God is only because of what Christ has done, that you are merely a recipient of God's amazing grace. He, is t- he has taken away your disgrace before God. He has redeemed you. You can be sure of that. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with you forevermore. Amen.